Um, and uh, so why don't you tell everyone what Gold's well, been up to? What, what, what was that comedian I saw online? He goes, it's the second thing we wrote. The first yeah. thing we wrote was, you can say anything you want, but you better get a guy. <laughs> right. You know, so it's, it's true. It's crazy. But yeah, we were talking, uh, the, the treatment of the Second Amendment as a civil right is, is really brand new in this country. Um, it's kind of been that stepchild, if you will, that nobody wanted to talk about. You know, forever they referred to it as a privilege, mm -hmm. not not a right. And ever since I took over a goal 15 whatever years ago, I will not use the word or the term gun rights on purpose. Mm -hmm. Guns don't have rights. And that's what the media still calls us. Oh, you're a gun rights group. Mm -hmm. No, I'm a civil rights group. And I continue to correct them on that. And basically, until we get the public to understand that, and accept it. Um, and to give you a little back history, when we collectively, the Second Amendment community, won Bruin, it was so amazing. Ah, it's over. We won. We won. And those of us that knew said, no, it's just getting started now. Hmm. Because I always point to Brown v. Board of Education and say, do you think they won that case and that was it? Hmm. No. I mean, Virginia literally, as I understand the history, shut down public education for two years. Mm -hmm. And look what happened with Governor Wallace of Alabama, which I compared Speaker Mariano for almost a year to Governor Wallace. So Bruin really set the pace of what was going to happen next. Just like Brown v. Board, Bruin was, you saw the states like New Jersey, New York, you know, Maryland, Mass, California, Illinois, just infuriated that the Supreme Court told them they had been wrong. Mm -hmm. So rather than comply, they doubled and tripled down, right. just like those southern states after Brown v. Board. So now is when things are going to get real interesting. And, and a lot of people have a hard time understanding, well, how can they do this? The, the Supreme Court's already ruled. The legislature is a different animal than most people really understand because they have complete immunity mm. from anything they do. Yeah. I mean, you literally have to find a dead body in their fridge before you can do something. Um, but, I mean, look how many speakers we have that became felons after they left office. Right. So, I mean, three consecutive ones. <laughs> literally, I've had to explain to people that the legislature could, in fact, reintroduce slavery to the state, and then it would be up to us citizens to then fight back against it in the courts, in the public opinion. But unfortunately, that's the way things work. And they know they're immune. Mm -hmm. They know they are. So they, they're going to do whatever the heck they want, and then it's up to us to stop them. What's really unfortunate about that is that's not the way the Constitution was set up. <laughs> Yeah. In fact, I believe it's... You mean that pesky little document, you know? Yes, <laughs> a pesky little document that nobody follows anymore. Yeah. Uh, but I forget what article it is under the Mass State Constitution that says that the people can change government whenever they want, yeah. for whatever reason they want. Uh, it's f up to and including their own personal happiness. Yeah. And I think it's Article 6. Uh, but anyway, regardless, the, the truth of the matter is we've, I, I, like you were making some great comparisons there. The comparison that I constantly come back to is we are living with the, uh, under Stockholm Syndrome. We have uh, become so compliant with tyranny, really, hmm. that we forgot what the, what, that the fountain, the true fountain of power is from the people. Yeah. Like, that's what Madison wrote in Federalist 49, that we are the true fountain of power. And, and our state constitution backs that up over and over and over. And it's, you know, obviously that's from early, even earlier than our, our U.S. constitution was ratified 11 years later. But um, the, tr the truth of the matter is the power is in the hands of the people. But yet we've grown accustomed to being dictated what our rights are or what they should be, or how they can just change them. Yeah, so what, our, what our privileges have right. become. Now, an interesting thing, uh, when I was on a flight last year, um, like him or hate him, doesn't matter, but Richard Dreyfus wrote a book, very short book. It's called One Thought That Scares Me. 
And the whole book is about how we haven't taught civics for 50 years in our schools. Mm. And that was intentional because they didn't want good citizens. They wanted good workers. Good workers, you know, and good citizens do not blend together very well. So when we, you and I, you know, now that you're in the fight with us, Tom, <laughs> welcome. Um, you know, we constantly have to explain to people on how the system works. Right. And uh, yeah, it's funny, one time Carrie Ann, who now works for us, when Mike Harris and I first brought her to the State House and we were watching a Senate debate, and she was just, it's so funny to watch it from new eyes. Wait a minute, what are they doing? Can they do that? Wait a minute, isn't that unconstitutional? They have to, and it was just, and I told her, I said, Carrie Ann, your first mistake was learning you had civil rights. Mm. Your second was finding out you really didn't. Right. Because they're basically, dished out to you as they please, mm. um, and then you have to fight for the rest. And because the Second Amendment was never treated as a civil right, it's even harder for us. And, you know, we talked off, off air when I did the research years ago. It took the United States Supreme Court 50 years to really figure out the First Amendment to get us where we are now. The Second Amendment before the uh, uh, Supreme Court is still brand new. And Bruin was probably the broadest case I ever saw come out of the Supreme Court because normally they deal with a very finite issue. Mm -hmm. You just don't bring a case to them, okay, the Second Amendment should do all this. Not how they work. Right. But Bruin was pretty broad. And now it's like you almost see a little backpedaling because now they don't want to take any more cases um, to, to back up what they're doing. So we'll see. But th this is uh, this is going to be a struggle. And the fact that you guys got the coalition, what, almost 100,000 signatures, mm -hmm. you know, woke up a whole lot of people mm -hmm. as to not only the, how bad the bill was, but how bad the so-called process was. And, and that's also very important that people understand. You, you know, you keep saying the Constitution says this. But the, the first rule they have in the state house is they can break their own rules. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, that's true. They did that when they passed H 4885, whatever it was at the time when the House passed their bill, because someone stood up in opposition. I was there that day as you were. We're all watching from, yeah. the, from the gallery. We watched Mike Day go on this big uh, diatribe of how there's plenty of historical analog analogous support for this law. And he started in the 1600s, which yeah. none of that has any bearing on <laughs> the laws we live under today when the nation was founded in 1776 and ratified. Well, actually, I disagree with it. It has a lot of bearing, but the, that's why we did what we did in 76. Right, right. So it's like he was actually citing laws that caused the revolution yes. as, his, as being in his defense. So. And... You know, you made a prediction, I remember early on, that you've awoken the giant, mm. the sleeping giant, and that's exactly what uh, has happened. And you, you alluded to the 95,000 signatures we turned in last week. That is a result of the people who have been woken up by this. I also made a prediction right after Bruin, way before any of the H 4885 stuff, but I, I said, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Absolutely. Um, yeah. This is, it will get better, I have no doubt, but it is going to get worse because tyrants don't like to be told mm. what to do and how to do it and that you have to follow those pesky documents like the Constitution. That's unfortunately what the Supreme Court has done. And honestly, the Bruin uh, case, there wasn't anything truly remarkable about that case. It was more of an affirmation of Heller as good law um, and but what they did differently in Bruin than than Heller was they gave the courts the paint by number formula to follow mm. and said this is how you must treat all future Second Amendment uh, challenges. Right. And that's where the whole temper tantrum came yeah. from. Yeah. That's where I, I read something just the other day by then Attorney General Maura Healy, and man, they did not like that. Ooh. They they, you know, that's when they said activist court, activist judges, and it's like, break it down for me. What is activist, what is extremist about standing up for 
the Constitution. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. that to me is mind boggling. Well, the funny thing is, Bruin really only affected about six states. The rest right. of the country's fine. Right. Don't do anything stupid. Don't you know? Don't become a felon. Go do what you want. I mean, I think there's only six states that even license long guns. It's you yeah. know nobody does that. So it's the it's the tantrum states that are now the last problem for this. Yeah, I mean, you can nitpick on on, on certain things. You don't like this in Texas. You don't like this and wherever, but, you know, these are the battleground states now. This is where the fight is, right. period. Yeah. Um, and it's going to take us years. Now, the other thing we talked about off here was I've been telling people ever since the Clinton era, their goal is not to confiscate your guns. They have no intention of lining you up and making you turn in your guns. That is not what they want. Mm -hmm. What they want is basically, in this case in Massachusetts, 650,000 felons in waiting. Mm. If they want you, they got gotcha. you. Right. Especially with the registry that was never supposed to be in place. Um, they know what you have, and if they want to interpret the laws in any way they want, uh, which we know they will, if it's convenient, they can then drop so many charges on you mm. that you'll beg, borrow, and steal to get out from underneath of it. And then once they get you to admit to something or a plea deal. Now you're a felon. Now you can't own guns. Now you can't vote. That's their mission, mm. is to keep that many people. And when Maura did what she did in 16, I had tons of people. Well, why doesn't she enforce this? And every time I answered the same way, is it more politically powerful to prosecute a few people or keep 600,000 people scared to death? Right. You know? Now, I know a lot of people out there, you and I, Toby, well, I'm not scared. I'll do anything. Yeah, face 100 years in charges right. and, and, and see how you feel. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And uh, the, the truth is that this is what happens in a society when we allow the government to wade into areas where they have no privilege to wade. And this is exactly what has happened, especially uh, they've really put an exclamation point on it in the last few months here uh, with the passage, the, you know, coming out of conference committee, the passage without reading the bill, then the signature less than a week later, and then 71 days later, signing an emergency preamble retroactively, which I, I still can't find any other case where that has been done in our state for purely political purposes to silence the voice of nearly 100,000 people. And uh, all the while when questions say, Oh no, the reason we did this is we had to read the bill and find yeah. out what was in it. Yeah. You know, so it's one of those Nancy Pelosi things. You gotta yeah. pass it so you know what's in it. And it's like, give me a break. Uh, they're really peeing on our leg and telling us it's raining outside. They think we're that stupid. And uh, the, so getting back to the original point is, this is the result of us operating in, with a, with a uh, that whole S Stockholm Syndrome. We get so used to and conditioned that our rights come from the lawgivers or from government in some way, shape, or form, and they don't. But we, we get conditioned into that. And secondly, number one, there's two different types of law, really. There's the malum in se, where it's evil, it's bad. It, everybody, without any question of whether or not you pass a law, you know it's bad. Like rape, robbery, murder, kidnapping. Like this mm. is inherently evil. That's yeah. what our government is designed to deal with. The malum prohibitum laws, which is what it's illegal because we say it's illegal, yeah. is what is jamming good people up right now. If you have a collapsible stock on your gun, it magically turns it into an assault weapon. Right. And it's like, our founders would legit roll over in their grave. They probably are spinning in their graves right now. If, if they were to know like that government thinks they have the privilege to make these malum prohibitum laws that infringe upon and all of a sudden, like to your point, make us a felon in waiting. Yep. You get caught with the wrong feature on your gun, you're now a felon. You get caught with uh, a certain place you can't carry a gun, you're now a felon in waiting. You've committed no crime. But by the way, you mentioned that piece. In this new law, those voter drop boxes yeah. are now polling places. 
You can't carry within 100 feet of them. Unbelievable. So, But who knows that? Right. Nobody knows that. So in, in not only are they passing laws that are prohibited for no reason other than well, look what we did kind of thing, law enforcement has no clue what to do with this. The state agencies have no clue what to do with this. And, and what we're witnessing already is that as we file federal court actions, they just suspend that part of the law. So, which, if it wasn't so disgusting, it was hilarious that the same week the governor filed an emergency order, they started suspending pieces of the law. So, wow, it was such an emergency. Oh, but not this piece, you know. So well, they knew they couldn't implement it. So right. they're like, we got to punt on this. We have to punt on that, right. which is amazing that they can give themselves such broad, wide latitude, right. but yet require of us to comply, right? Yep. It's, it's that I think is the most nefarious part of this. It's rules for thee, but not for me. Yep. And they've created this truly the, the gap between government and the civilian population is widened even further to where, you know, there's now a second class of mm -hmm. people that have been created again in violation of mass constitutional uh, of the mass constitution i believe it's article seven that says you cannot have a separate set of rules for an entire class of men no and now i mean just the the fact of what they've done it, right. it, it's it's mind-boggling you're a second class citizen and um you're it, it's almost as if we're all all on probation right literally because if you break a rule that you don't even know about, we got you. Right. And a great example of that was, you know, you and I have talked about how it affected hunters, mm. both resident and non-resident hunters, especially down here in the South Coast, you know, sea duck hunting and whatever is huge. Well, I approached Fish and Wildlife and I said, are you going to contact the hunters directly with the law changes? And they said, no, nah, we'll post something up on the website. That is not good enough. So we FOIA'd the database with all of the names and addresses so we can contact, we sent out 60,000 pieces of mail to hunters in mass warning them about what had just changed. And bear in mind, we only have 22,000 members, but we mailed out 60,000 pieces of mail. And then what we did was we got the non-resident hunting license holders and we did 6,600 pieces to the border states. And that, like what happened with your gathering signatures, Boy, that woke up the hunting community big mm -hmm. time. And now Fish and Wildlife is trying to backpedal. But meanwhile, the environmental police are like, we have no clue what to do with this right. thing. So it's, it's a matter of not only did you pass laws that are so egregious, it's the worst in modern U.S. history as far as civil rights, but you have no plan to inform the general public as to what the hell just happened. And also you really can't enforce it you know it's like the only way you can enforce it is if somebody gets jammed up for some other reason hmm. like there's no way to to enforce this law not not that they should either i, I would love to see law enforcement finally pull stand together up. and stand up to this and say you know this isn't gonna this isn't gonna work hmm. you, i i want to circle back to what something you just said when i got my license to carry at 18 you could still get a license to carry that. I'm dating myself. Uh, but at 18 years old, I remember thinking to myself as I applied at the local police department and saw that DeSegis, you know, the Department of Criminal Justice Information Services is the one that administers and does the record keeping and the, you know, all the, the yeah. blue cards we used to submit for, right. for firearms transfers. I'm like, what the heck? does the Department of Criminal Justice Information Services have to do with me owning a gun? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But it makes a lot of sense when you put the felon in waiting category into the mix and you say, yep. you're already in the system, brother. You're just yeah. on one side of the fence and all they got to do is flick the switch at some point and you'll be on the other side of the fence. I'll give you a great example. This was years ago. Uh, there used to be a Senator Barrios, Barrios out of Cambridge and we didn't agree on almost anything, but we talked all the time. And he came up with this great idea that the state police should be able to do random inspections of the homes of licensed gun owners to make sure they could 
demonstrate the guns registered in their name were still theirs. And we're going to give the state police. They jumped higher than we did because they said, Senator, you be the first one up the sidewalk because we're not doing that. <laughs> and then I said, well, how about this, Senator? Rather than doing that to us, how about you have the state police do random inspections of the homes of people who are on probation or have been released from a felony prison? And his statement to me was, you can't do that. They have rights. Listen to what you just said, Senator. They have rights. Right. But you're telling us we don't. That's how we are treated in this state. It's, it's unbelievable. Well, I think... Uh all the banned states that you referenced before are kind of collaboratively view the gun owners of their states, rep respective states, as a problem that needs to be solved. And uh, look at what Harris said back mm -hmm. in the day, mm -hmm. that they reserve the right to go door to door and, and inspect and make sure you're properly storing guns. And yep. It's like... You know, since when did we suspend the Fourth Amendment here, the Fifth Amendment? And, uh, you know, but that's how they view us. Like, well, remember there was, a, there was a time in history where they called it the final solution, right? Mm -hmm. So we are the problem. It's, and I don't want to get too deep into these weeds, but one of the reasons that the Attorney General, both in New York and Washington, D.C., went after the NRA is, like love them or hate them, Wayne Lapierre did some horrible stuff, put us in really bad situations. But that wasn't their reasoning. Their reasoning was the NRA was the last member group that could take on the federal government. Hmm. And they wanted them out of the way um, because they knew that if they disbanded legally the NRA, no one would ever rebuild what was there. Hmm. And that was their intention because the Second Amendment community here in Massachusetts, you know, we're 650,000 strong, California, you name it. We are literally in the way because once the Second Amendment community is done with, they can do whatever they want. Right. Not that they don't do it anyway, but you think things are bad now. Wait. Right. No, I agree with you 100% there. Yeah. Um, and I want to circle back to that in just a minute. We're going to go to a quick break. And, all right, welcome back to Rapid Fire, your weekly show all things guns, freedom, Second Amendment, and self-defense. Having a fascinating conversation here with Jim Wallace from Just Gun Just riveting. Actually, <laughs> yes. Uh, talking about how we are now the second class of society as far as the those in the ivory tower of mm. the people's house. Maybe they'll change the name. Might even be third now. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, so. um, you mentioned there's 22,000 members at goal. Yeah. What the heck, guys? We got 650,000 gun owners in Massachusetts. We got to get those numbers up. So, yeah. where can people go to sign up? Just go right to the Goal website now. Goal.org. Uh, Goal.org. It's all set up. You just click on join, join now, and go through the process. And you can join right online. Everything's all electronic these days. I mean, we still have the paper applications and, and so forth. But join online. You get right into the system. As a matter of fact, uh, I will put out a little bit of a warning that as we go forward here, more and more of the Gold website is going to be members only mm -hmm. because our members are really complaining that they're bearing the brunt for 600,000 people out there who are getting everything at their expense. It's not greed. It's just we, we are a membership organization. We have a duty to our members. While we try to protect and help everybody in the Second Amendment community, these lawsuits cost a lot of money. Right. You know, these websites, as you see, Toby, this stuff isn't cheap, you know. Um, and believe me, none of us at Goal are making huge salaries. Uh, matter of fact, I joked with you earlier that we tried to hire a director of communication, and the salary requests were so high that I told my uh, board I was going to resign and take that job because <laughs> it paid more, and it was only like a sixth of what I do. So. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's, it's vitally important because what happens is the, the media, when they ask us and they say, well, you only have 22,000 members, so you really don't speak for the Second Amendment community. Mm -hmm. There's 600,000 out, out there. So it, it's imperative, especially in this fight, that they, they belong to goal. And of course, they need to support us. They need to support the Civil Rights Coalition because 
this is not going to happen tomorrow. Right. This is going to be a sustained fight for a number of years. Even if the court cases are successful, it could take two or three years to get up to the right. Supreme Court, and then they could just say no. Yeah. So it's it, it's a long, sustained fight, and hopefully someday I won't be sitting here. <laughs> like, but there is no retirement from coal, so I will just have to go sell spices or cook food somewhere. But um, I am losing hair rapidly from this job. <laughs> so, but anyway, it's it's important, and we try to. The other thing we, we can't do, and I really wish we had the bandwidth, is non-members constantly call, email, or they post questions on our social media. We do not have the bandwidth to answer private questions. Mm -hmm. Members, we will do our best to answer phone calls, but we are at a point now where we're looking from 50,000 feet and as much as we'd like to talk to everybody individually, we just don't have the bandwidth. And I certainly don't have the staff that can sit there and monitor Facebook, Instagram, you know, X, which used to be Twitter, uh, whatever, talk rooms, and just continually to answer questions. Because then the other thing, Toby, is it turns out to be debates. Right. Even if you answer the question, then it turns into a debate. Right. So as much as we would love to be able to help you with it, we, we just simply can't. Well, I think you guys have done a phenomenal job on the website, on the Frequently Asked Questions page, on breaking this down. I know there's like a war room there. Every time some <laughs> notice comes out, you guys all yeah. have to rip through it, tear yeah. through it. You probably debate internally. and Oh, you know, it's fun. The bourbon, the bourbon comes out <laughs> early. Wish. And, and uh, you know, it's uh, – but the, the yeah. truth of the matter is um, – I think percentage-wise, you're probably very similar to the NRA on a national level. I think at the pinnacle of its mm. uh, membership, it was six million, if I'm not mistaken. It was up there, but standard for any type of organization could be Mass Audubon. Mm. Is whatever collectively that group is, you get three to five percent, right? And that's it. Yeah, and, and that's about. I mean, if you have a hundred million gun owners in America, and mm. six million of them are members of the largest, yeah organization in the in the country uh, I would love to say that Massachusetts could be the anomaly to the yeah. rule and say guys we got to get our numbers up here there's uh, and but I will say out of the hundred thousand people that signed our petition I would probably say 40,000 of them were gun owners yeah believe it or not 60,000 of oh, those sure. people were yeah. non-gun owners they're, we had more people come in and they're pissed yeah and uh they're yeah. like uh, you know i don't even own a gun but i am not happy with what is going on yeah. at, 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 at on the state level yeah. and uh so what what is it that goal could do should the membership and money come in what is it that would help goal do the, you know their job better uh, what is well, it? Well, let, let's back up. Yeah. What is Goal faced with right now, and what is the number one uh, job of Goal going forward? Well, the, the the biggest problem we have, and it's not necessarily because of lack of membership, but is is public presence, because uh, every time we tried to like do an ad on Facebook, we experimented last year and tried to meld it around the domestic violence program that we put out. Didn't even mention gun. Doop, shut us down, suspended us. Um, <laughs> I remember I just put a post on the Goal Facebook. I used the picture of your store but didn't even say it. I just said, support your local shops while you can. Boom, suspended from Facebook. Um, Crazy. YouTube ads, same thing. They won't take us. So two years ago with the uh, when we were starting to roll out, the domestic violence thing, you know, self-defense is a human right. We went to media companies, billboards, especially the new electronic billboards. Mm -hmm. What we found out was there's a huge number of those billboards that are on state property. Mm -hmm. Won't take our business. Mm -hmm. So radio shows will not take our, I mean, how we would, but, you know, that's, right. that's a limited audience, but will not take our commercials. Even I tried to approach some just on, like, Education like PSA, safe storage and stuff, nope, won't do it. TV certainly not going to take our stuff. Mm. So a lot of people are frustrated and saying, well, we don't even know who you are because you're not out there. It's because we can't. Right. They won't let us out. When we first opened the shop 10 years ago now, a little over 10 years ago, uh, 
we tried to advertise on the local country radio show yeah. station, and uh, they wouldn't take our money. Mm. Uh, the salesperson came in and was like, uh, "I'm really embarrassed to say that we won't, we can't run your ad." And I said, "Do you know who your bread is buttered by? <laughs> like, are you seriously like not gonna take our money because you know it has to do with guns?" And I'm like. You guys should go into a different line of music. I, I, w I would recommend the country, but anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, that we've faced, we've, we've had two Instagram pages shut down and two yeah. Facebook pages shut down. Yeah. We've only got one strike on YouTube, surprisingly enough. Mm. Uh, I've had shows, we used to do a segment, we still do, uh, called Gun of the Week in the middle of the show. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, 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 and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But I used to do it live where I'd just pull out a gun and talk over it, and then all of a sudden, boom, the, the live feed would go dead. It was it was just done. Like, people were like, what happened? I'm like, I don't know what happened. And as soon as you touch that, they change their yeah. policy. When you're doing lives, you can't have a gun. Yeah. And uh, so now we, we roll like an ad in the middle of it. But uh, yeah, the, the policies keep changing. The, the, we're constantly up against uh, up against mm -hmm. the algorithms that try to keep con content like this down. Uh, by the way, let's answer a few questions. Sure. Uh, Scott's wondering what you feel your chances of winning at trial are. I would never predict what a court would ever do, because if I could do that, boy, I'm not making anywhere near enough money. <laughs> uh, the, the problem is you never know. Number one, what judge you're going to get? Right. Because I don't think we've been assigned a judge yet. Um, so there are just so many factors going into this. It, you know, the first circuit is so fickle; it's not even funny. We were lucky during COVID when we joined uh, action against the governor. Remember, we closed the shops yeah. And, yeah. and everything else. We got a great judge, Judge Woodlock. The problem is, we won. The judge never put the decision in writing. Really? Which I've never heard of. Really? But so we can't actually grab that and say, see here, um, I don't even know how you'd go about getting it because it was never put in writing. That's crazy. Um, so, yeah, we, we don't ever predict things like that. Now, the other problem is, too, is, you know, everybody says, oh, you got to get this to the Supreme Court. Yeah, we do, but you just can't walk into the Supreme Court. Right. You have to go through the process. First district, you know, you got to go through them and then maybe the appellate and then whatever. But... This happened in 2016 after Moore pulled her stunt. Mm -hmm. Thank God the NRA helped us financially. We took two years going through the system, got all the way up to the Supreme Court, and they just said no. Right. Because not that they ruled against us, they just weren't going to take the case because that's their privilege. Yeah. They only take, what, 3%, 1% of the cases that even yeah. come their way. Well, in, it's in just, the 70s, when it was largely a democratically appointed court, uh, they used to take twelve to fifteen hundred cases a year. Yeah. Now they take three to five hundred, more around the three hundred range. Yeah. Yeah. It's and very there, low. There's five to ten thousand cases that are petitioning the court, and they end up taking three to five hundred, usually in the three hundreds. So, if we we've already got two cases that have been granted cert um, around a Second Amendment. I think our best hope is for three, and I would love to see the Snopes v. Brown, uh, which used to be the Bianchi case out of the Fourth Circuit. <laughs> that thing's been hanging around longer than some pennies I have for crying out loud. Well, it's insane. You know, it's funny you say yeah. that because that is something to consider when we take court actions. And when I say we, I don't necessarily mean you and me or collectively. I just mean in general right like if we always go for the preliminary injunction or the injunctive mm -hmm. relief the courts play ping pong with this from the district court yep. to the circuit court of appeals for years and the supreme court after those seven cases from the seventh circuit in, in illinois were seeking cert the the supreme court i think it was justice thomas said we're not going to take it because it's on an interlocutory appeal and we will not take a it's very rare for the courts to take a, a case yeah. that's on they need a final judgment well Allah, we have this maryland case the snopes v brown which is on a final judgment 
And this is like, all right, court, name that tune. You yeah. just said you won't take it until, well, here it is. Name that tune. And really, I think... Name that tune while wow, it's old. The, yeah, I know. <laughs> they have to take one of these cases because yeah. right now a third of America mm -hmm. is affected. Yeah. You got 10 states that have some form of an assault weapons ban or a mag capacity ban. Yeah. That represents even for 100 Mott, million people. Right? Vermont has right. a mag ban. So the, the other thing that people need to understand, too, is, you know, we've had some people get very angry with us. Well, how come you haven't filed for an immediate injunction? Those are incredibly rare. Right. I mean, I couldn't name you the last time I saw one of those. You literally have to have somebody in imminent danger of whatever, you know, death penalty or, you know, they're going to be put in prison for life or they're in prison. I mean, those injunctions are incredibly rare. And because the Second Amendment is so new to the courts, that likelihood of something like that happening, you know, is, is incredibly right. slim at best. Now, I know people see things, you know, a national group would say, hey, we filed something and we won. But what you don't realize is as soon as they win, it's appealed, and then it's tied right. up in court, and then the injunction doesn't work anyway. So we are absolutely not focusing on that. We're focusing on the subject matters. Yeah. So well, that was the longest answer to a simple question. I know, but it's <laughs> it's true. The the I so getting back to what I was going to say about that is it, it's almost a better strategy to take what we get in district court, whether it's a win or a loss, and it's going to get appealed by either side yeah. to the circuit court, where we're going to take a win or a loss and appeal to the Supreme Court. That's what Cargill did, mm. and it got there quickly, right? The yeah. bump stock ban, I think it was all wrapped up yeah. in 18 Don't months. argue over an injunction. Right, because the, the injunctive relief, which I would I would benefit from, yeah, sure. yeah. would just delay, and in fact, it'll probably not be granted anyway, and you'll be fighting over the injunctive relief and meanwhile, never be able to be presented to the Supreme Court. Because the other thing, too, with that, and, of course, we talk to, with our attorneys about this constantly. Um, and, by the way, we have some of the top attorneys in the country working on this stuff. You know, you know them. You've talked to them many mm -hmm. times. Um, if you go for that in the ping-pong effect that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. they will bankrupt you. Right. They have endless money, endless right. resources. We don't. Yeah. So we have to be very careful about what we spend resources trying to do. Uh, each case, because this law is so huge, we have to break it down into subject matters and then go before a court on a particular issue with the bill. No federal court or even state court is going to take the whole thing. Right. They won't do that. Right. So each piece as we try to bring it through the federal system, district, circuit, maybe appellate, whatever, and go up anywhere, by the time you get to the Supreme Court, 500000 to a $1 million. Yeah. And that there's a lot in that depending upon discovery and all kinds of things that can cost us money if the state wants to drag things out. So it's not just a matter of walking into a courtroom and saying, here, do this. Mm -hmm. And as you've mentioned before, it's kind of funny because people will say, well, I got a guy who will do it for nothing. No. Right. Supreme Court literally has a list of attorneys that they will work with. Mm -hmm. If you ain't on that list, you ain't arguing before the Supreme Court. Right. They don't mess around. As a matter of fact, even the attorneys we work with, they wouldn't be the final ones before the Supreme Court. Um, interestingly enough, as a side story, the NRA's First Amendment case against New York State went to the Supreme Court and, it, you know, makes weird, you know, bedfellows, uh, was the, um, sorry, what the heck is it? The uh, ACLU. ACLU, yeah. their attorney actually argued the case for us mm -hmm. and won, but now it goes back. So even if something like happens, and one of the things we've seen the Supreme Court do a lot is, okay, but... Go look at this again under Brewer. GVR, yeah. So yep. now you're like, oh, God, this is going to take another couple of years. I mean, look at New Jersey and Maryland, how long they held on right. and, and didn't want to release. And then 
New Jersey does this weird thing and says, okay, ARs are good, but nothing else right. is. Yeah, that doesn't make and, any sense. Well, the only reason they did that was because of the case that come of Rahimi mm -hmm. that came out of Texas, and two of the rather far-left judges made a mistake in their opinion. They said ARs are a gun in common use. Mm. So they kind of screwed themselves. Well, Sotomayor did that. Sonia yeah. Sotomayor yeah. in her dissent yeah. on, oh, in her concurrence right. of Rahimi, yeah. wrote uh, that they he bought a gun that is in common. I don't. I don't. It wasn't common use, but commonly available. Yeah, were the words Something. she used yeah. Yeah. in the Rahimi case, right. and it's like, thank you, Sotomayor. <laughs> That's exactly what we needed you to say in your. Uh, concurring opinion, but um, what else we got? Anything? Yeah, let's see what else we got here. Uh, Blue Curtain says virtually zero percent chance at injunction at the first district, yeah, uh, or the first circuit. But uh, uh, and Billy says I've learned one thing about gold: they are very efficient. They do the best they can to protect our rights with the money they have. Uh, so yes, let's spread the word and get them to ha uh, get some more money in in the coffers. But uh, all right, question for Jim: Since antiques that take cartridges and muzzle loaders that take 209 primers are now firearms under mass law, do they have to be transferred to an FFL or just registered? Well, that's extremely complicated now because there are antiques that are still good. If they take a cartridge, and I'm trying to remember the exact language, a that's not readily cartridge. available right. through whatever process is commercial uh, availability. The other piece is uh, typically, let's just say, use inlines as an example. If that uses a 209 primer, that is now a modern firearm. So under the rules, whenever they enforce this stuff, you'd have to have a license to possess it, minimum FID, and you'd have to register it. So you sell them. <clears throat> Sorry. So you sell them. And I even see tags on your floor now requires 4473. Mm. So they will be required to go through the normal process. The other thing that's really weird, and we can't figure this out, there used to be an exemption in the law, I think it was 129C, for the possession of antique, black powder, muzzle loaders, whatever you want to refer to them as, and the ammunition. They removed the ammunition hmm. piece. So the exemption for the ammo is no longer there. And it's one of the hard things we have, and I, and I totally understand it. People will read it and say, Jim, I don't see that in a law. Because it isn't. Right. It's what they took out. Hmm. It's not what they put in. Um, so it would appear, and even Chief Glidden agrees, that, okay, you can still have the gun, but the black powder, the cap, the ball, everything else, you need a minimum FID card. And that harms an awful lot of people that after 98 lost their right and they went to black powder. Now they're screwed again. Right. Yeah. So, and uh, what problem are we trying to solve? <laughs> We're trying to keep deer. Deer's lives are... Yeah. You know, important. Well, dear, dear lives matter, I guess. It's all those drive-by flintlock pistol shootings right. in Bedford. <laughs> you know, so. All right, what SCOTUS case do you feel is the most important for us to win next year? Oof, my Lord. Line them up. Let's go. Um, you know, I really can't answer that because e e <laughs> even if you win, it depends upon what it says. Um, so it's very difficult to find out what, what's going to be peeled away, you know, and how the lower court is going to manipulate it to present it to the higher court. And one of the things you actually hope for is it, to get it to the Supreme Court quicker is a differencing of opinion between district courts around the country. So, so sorry, circuit courts. So, you know, the ninth ruled this way and normally people would say oh cool we need another one to rule the same no you want them to rule right. differently because now there's a conflict nationwide so then it goes up and gets fixed but who knows i mean you never know what how something will change because let's say they rule on max right mm -hmm. we get a good ruling on max they may say something else in there 
that then leads us down the road to more. So it's very difficult to say what, what would be the most important. Yeah, right now I think uh, we have the Smith & Wesson, the Mexico has been granted cert. That's the Pilka case, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms yeah. Act. Mexico suing us. Suing Come us, on, yeah. suing, really? Suing Smith & Wesson <laughs> and like five or six other manufacturers yeah. For, yeah. For, their, for their evil, dangerous product that ends yeah. up in Mexico in the hands of drug cartels because they yep. can't control their own population. Uh, then what was the other one that was granted cert? Um, well, the Maryland case is being considered. Right. I don't. But I think uh, there was one other one that I don't remember if granted. New Jersey, if that's going to move forward or not through the process, because they did so say okay to ARs, but not other stuff. So right. I haven't heard Scott Box, my colleague down there that runs their state association. I haven't heard if they're moving forward. Um, but that's the other thing that you mentioned too, Tob, is what the lower courts will do is, even if the Supreme Court says, okay, your ruling's wrong, go back and review this under Bruin, they will sit on it for years because there's no timeline hmm. given that, okay, you must do this in 30 days. So they will sit on it for years, and what they're trying to do is wait out the members of the Supreme Court so that if, you know, Harris gets in, the court will change, and then they'll release all this right. stuff. So, yeah, I definitely want to touch on that later. Yeah. There's a huge a bunch of stuff to talk about in a few minutes, but before I do, um, what, and Maryland tried to do that, by the way. They requested a 30 day delay on the Supreme Court, on their briefs before the Supreme yeah. Court. Yeah. They granted it the first time. Then they asked for another 30 days, which would have put it out into the 25-26 term. Mm. And the Supreme Court said, no, we'll give you another 10 days. Bring the briefs. Mm -hmm. So that should be about due right now. Um, but anyway, um, we have a question about, does the law change anything with a Type 3 FFL purchase, like a the uh, Curio and Relics license. Curio and Relics is is interesting. I haven't dove into that a lot, but in our discussions, it seems to be that Curios and Relics uh, license holders now have to buy from FFLs. Really? It looks like it. Mm -hmm. So that really changes everything for them. Um, at least that's our initial go at it. Um, you know, <laughs> I have to apologize because this thing is so egregious. We've had to kind of prioritize what we pay attention to. It's like, you know, what's bleeding the most people versus mm -hmm. something you can maybe handle later. Um, matter of fact, I, I had a gentleman contact us who's here on a work visa from China. He's been here nine years, has had a gun license for mass for the whole time and was just told, no, the law changed you have to have a green card in order to get a license, but a visa won't anymore. Mm. Well, there's only 50 of those. We're not going to launch into a, you know, a big campaign to, to, to fix that. But right. Cures and Relics is very interesting in the fact that I think that's maybe the biggest problem they're going to have mm. is they have to actually go through. Um, and then, of course, what is now considered stuff that has to be registered. Right. So. And there's no registration portal right now per se, right? They punted no. on that for 18 right. months. Yeah. Well, not officially. They, no. didn't, they didn't punt on that piece, which is confusing the hell out of people because, all right, the law says the mandate's there. What right. am I supposed to do? Do I use the Merck system to register my guns or do I have to wait? And so here's the interesting thing, what, what, what you had just said. The law punts the creation of a registration system. So here's the timeline. It's really messed up. In six months, the state has to notify us of the registration mandate. In a year, they have to have the system built. And then a year after that, everybody has to comply. So picture this. The government puts out all this information that you must register your guns. Now people are in a panic because they don't belong to gold. They don't watch you. It, it's like, oh, my God, what's going to happen? Well, the system's not there yet. Hmm. But is the Merck's system the system? Right. We don't know. 
because right. they're not saying anything. So other parts of this new law literally said this will not be enforced until uh, this did not. Right. The mandate's still in place, yeah. but it mentions about creating a system and a timeline. And the, we talked about this before the show, the, the gun owner, well, how about the guy with the license to carry from in New Hampshire who's got a non-resident license to carry in Mass, who's coming down for the weekend with his family and he's carrying his his gun. Yeah. How, there's, there's supposedly you've got to register that gun. Yeah, whether it's to hunt or carry or right. just come to shoot. Right, and, and how do you do that? Yeah, which, well, num <laughs> number one, how do they know? Right. He's yeah. going to put big bill boards on, on right. the mass border. Hey, you got to register. Right. And, and this was one of those things where you get into the you know debates with lawyers. It's like, well, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Well, yeah, but that's like me saying I just entered Hyannis, and I had no idea you could drive a Chevy truck in Hyannis. You know, and suddenly right. I'm in prison for 10 years. No, right. you can't do that. Yeah. So there's been no effort to educate anybody right now. Well, there's a bright line requirement for the law it's it's not supposed to be uh, if it's not a bright line it's entrapment mm. that's really the, the two options you can have a the bright line where everybody knows what it is because it's obvious yeah or you can have entrapment by your government and you're right the, again we've we've been lulled into this false sense of uh you know stockholm syndrome where we're like yeah ignorance is no excuse at the law if if you could extrapolate <laughs> what has been done with that phrase the same way that no right is absolute and apply it to any other law or any yeah. other right the way that they apply it to the second amendment we'd have had a revolution 100 years 50 years ago you know but the yeah. problem is uh we all just have, have been lulled into this stockholm syndrome but anyway uh so one of the things i want to touch on before we're out of time we have an election on tuesday you mentioned Harris getting, you know, in and having mm. some potential Supreme Court appointments. What do you think, on a scale of one to ten, this election of importance uh, for the Massachusetts people as well as nationally? What do you, you know, what's your feeling on it uh, as far as on a scale of one to ten of one being eh, and ten being the most important? Uh, for I'd the sake, a, I'd say a twelve. Yeah, it's a twelve. It's off the charts, yeah, right? It's off the charts because uh, this this is the tipping point for the country. Right now, I don't. I usually don't tend to get outside the Second Amendment stuff, but this is something people in the know have been watching for probably two decades. Probably, it's not going to happen now, but absolutely by the next presidential election. The, for the first time in the country, the majority of eligible voters will be paying no federal income tax. Mm. And why is that important? Because they don't care. They will vote for anything because they have no skin in the game. Yeah, no, yeah. And all of the people who are watching this are saying, once you breach that, you never come back. Mm. Never. Because they will just continue to build on that group of people to ensure that they never get out of office and you know we're 35 trillion in debt now what do they care for another 20 they don't care they have no hope of paying it back so it's this thing is more scary than the average person should even be worried about but it is it's this is the tipping point for the country right now right here mm -hmm. we don't win this i don't care if you hate trump doesn't matter. And the other, the other piece, too, and I'll, I'll say this personally, I really wish my daughter had a, a decent woman to vote for to be the first, first right. woman president. Yeah. This person has no business being anywhere near the White House. Mm. She's incompetent, uh, but doesn't matter. The powers to be, you know, want to go there. Um, <laughs> it's kind of funny, again, not to get a, too far off topic, but when I speak at universities, sometimes I ask them, as I start to talk, I said, I'm going to ask you a question I want you to answer later. 
what are the two most powerful corporations in this country? And then I let them think about it as I'm talking. And you get all kinds of answers. And then I tell them, two most powerful corporations are the RNC and the DNC. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And I said, name me another corporation that could write a check for $35 trillion. Mm -hmm. They control everything. They, those parties are corporations. People don't think of them that way, but they are. They're corporations. They fight for the power of their corporation. They don't give a damn about you and I. I don't care which one it is. Mm -hmm. But in this particular election, we have one choice and one choice only. Yeah, so. I agree, especially on the, on the national ticket. Uh, I hope that people will go to Gun Owners Action League's website and look at the roll call vote of the Senate mm -hmm. and the Although the Senate's pretty easy. There were four people that <laughs> voted against it. And basically, yeah. the House of Representatives pretty easy, too. There was six yeah. people that voted against it as Democrats. Mm -hmm. All the Republicans stayed together. And there were two people that were no vote. I don't know what they that is. They walked away. Yeah, they walked away. Yeah. So if, if somebody voted for this bill, in my opinion... We have to hold them accountable next Tuesday. Well, I will tell you this. You know, this is going back. Well, we always wait until after the session ends before we start to grade. It was the easiest grading session I've ever had working for goal because mm. you were either an F or an A. You right. know, I mean, I think there's a couple of B's in there. But um, so, yeah, if you go there now, the grades are up. I think the one thing we have to get up real quick is people who filled out, uh, you know, the questionnaire. Um a lot of people ask about that, too. If you see a letter grade, that's an incumbent. They have a record of voting. If you see a percentage grade, that's somebody who filled out a questionnaire. So we don't give 100% the same weight as we would give an A because mm -hmm. there's no back to them. You don't, right. you don't know. Uh, so we'll, we'll get those up, and we seldom endorse people just based on the questionnaire because that has burned us bad in the mm -hmm. past. Yeah. Where somebody fills out a perfect questionnaire, as soon as they get in office, poof, done. Yeah. Well, November 5th is less than a week away, and we have a great opportunity to right some wrongs. I know we won't have a clean slate, obviously, but uh, even if we could pick up four or five seats or flip a couple, or uh, if, you're, if they're running unopposed, write someone in. Uh, the, the way I see it is uh, let them feel the, the, let them sweat mm -hmm. for, for what they've done and uh, against our rights here in Massachusetts. But uh, where can people go to stay up to date with what Goal is doing and what, what follow along with the lawsuits and, and the work Goal's up to? <laughs> well, the lawsuits, we actually set up a separate page, uh, which I need to update probably tomorrow. Uh, it's just gold.org slash legal. Real okay. easy to remember. Go there. We'll have all the cases listed. As a matter of fact, we put out a bunch of information yesterday and today, and I'll update the page with that stuff probably today or tomorrow. Well, tomorrow. Um, we're also on Facebook, Instagram, X, uh, now, um, Northeast Shooters. We, we post on there pretty regularly. So we're all over the place. Uh, the information's out there. You know, again, I will, I will say I'm really, I apologize to, to whatever extent possible. We cannot handle answering everybody's individual question. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's sad because when they go to their state reps who voted for it, they can't answer anything. Right. So if I had my way, every legislator that voted for it would be given a written exam. And if they can't pass the exam, they're out of office and the bill, and the bill is repealed mm -hmm. because they have no clue what they voted for. Right. Yeah, no doubt about it. I think... Uh if you violate your oath of office, you should be voted out. Of, you should be shown the door as well. So mm -hmm. I know I'm uh, preaching to the choir, but I, the 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 truth of the matter is, uh, next Tuesday we have a, a means to an end, and uh, it, once that's done, we'll get on with phase two of uh, getting back in the courts and educating the public on mm -hmm. civics 101. Hashtag you can't do that. <laughs> well, it's like. It's like those of us, the small group that are working to fix the NRA, we've made great strides in May, but I tell people, and it's similar with this election, this will build the foundation mm -hmm. to give us the ability to move forward. Without the foundation, you can't build anything. Right. 
So this will just be making the foundation, bringing it back. And then we need to rebuild this country. And it's certainly Massachusetts, yeah. my Lord. But you know, 30 bucks a year, guys. It's the it. price of a box of ammo, for crying out loud. Probably less in some cases. In some cases, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. a good box of ammo is going to run you 30 bucks. Even if you're just getting the news. Yeah. Because if you're a member, you get our Friday email news. And that brings in everything from what's going on in the courts. We won't even talk about the state house anymore, but you know, even what's going on at clubs, because our, our affiliated clubs will give us information about what the heck's going on. So, uh, just to get that news and to keep informed is is worth the thirty bucks. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Well, the the work you're doing is worth the thirty bucks. So, uh, <laughs> thanks a lot, Jim. I appreciate okay. you coming That's in. Right, man. And uh, we're gonna go to a quick break. We'll be back on the other side. You're listening to Rapid Fire. Now I'm gonna walk the store with my trick or treat bag. Yeah, there you go.